central role for civil society and civil society organizations. Because the kind of work on checking that this information that comes in that Tom Arnett has done is carried forward by civil society organizations, or as Laura has also said, government isn't necessarily well set up to respond to some of the challenges of disinformation that we see. And as we've also heard this morning, one of the questions is, should government even interfere when we have information that is being disseminated? Should government get into uh, the space of regulating uh, information flows or maybe reducing argument or not? So civil society information have a central role, but they themselves increasingly operate in illegal, illegal contexts. Whatever measure you take, uh, Freedom House or other ways of tracking democracy, it's, there's reversal across the world, and not only on the fringes, but also often in the center of well-established democracies, that includes places also like Hungary uh, and other EU countries. And how civil society operations can operate well is a key question. Now, a new angle in this one is that the legitimacy of CSOs is being attacked. And it's being attacked often with exactly the same rhetoric that is being used uh, against governments or in order to demand accountability from governments by demanding transparency and accountability from the civil society organizations. And for that reason, uh, we undertook some research, or this research was for the Transparency and Accountability Initiative. Transparency and Accountability Initiative has DFID, it's Ford Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, Open Society. So it's a big organization, and they wanted to look at, at these trends across the world. So it's not just this region, it's also in other countries. So it's going to be a bigger, bit of a bigger kind of canvas here, but I think it illustrates trends that we see very well and that tie directly into what we just heard before on some of those trends. So what, what are we seeing? There are three lines of argument against the civil society organizations. They frame the debate against the CSOs, and so it's not just a legal debate, it's not just a regulatory debate but it's actually a kind of political debate about who represents what and about legitimacy. What they try to do, uh, we heard these before, there are another three Ds here, they try to divide, distract, divide, and detach, and walk you through that. And this responds to actual gaps. So there are problems on the civil society side as well, as I'll illustrate, uh, and I think that can be dealt with, and we have dating recommendations. I can say more later on methodology, etc. I want to take you through this relatively quickly, so uh, on just the key messages. So what are the problems of attack on civil society organizations? And some of those we have seen in the Georgian context as well. The, there are really three problems that people use, or three arguments that people make. First, it's the funding transparency, especially for foreign funding. Where does your money really come from? Who is behind those people? And really the demand that they should be, these organizations should be transparent. And we have a special case on that uh, also in Ukraine, where we then move also to the second one, that asset income disclosure, which is mandatory for many politicians, government officials, is demanded of CSO leadership, of the leadership of uh, NGOs. This is a famous case of that is in Ukraine. It is also a case in India. It's also discussed in other contexts. And uh, third here, accountability and governance, that there's specific demands on how these CSOs should be accountable. There are very extreme cases, like Egypt, where people need to kind of submit agendas two weeks in advance. Um, and I'll say more about why that matters, because uh, it, it frames the debate. And one of the ways that it frames the debate also, as you mentioned here, is that often precedent is being invoked. And so what the EU does, or what the United States does, is often gets referred to, even in Russia. That in Russia, when it introduced the foreign agents law, also made reference to American legislation. So how does it frame the debate? What actually, what's the real message that, that's being kind of put out here? Well, one of the first pieces of the message is, these NGOs, these civil society organizations, they are foreign. They are not really local, 
they don't represent local authentic interests, grassroots interests, but they're kind of cosmopolitan differently. They're not one of us. The second in that, they're self-appointed. There is no real legitimacy. They're not democratically legitimized. These are even arguments that governments have made in the United Nations in arguing for more regulation or for a tightening of civic space. And then the third one, they are privileged. And for example, by demanding asset disclosure from NGOs, you then make an argument about what's the appropriate level of salary. If you compare that to the rural constituency, the populists often appeal to any salary of the head of an NGO is, of course, going to be a high salary by comparison. But then the conversation ends up being uh, about the NGOs and not necessarily about the issues that they represent. Now, what's important in that is that often these uh, arguments are put on the front, and in the back of that, there are enforcement mechanisms. So, when you look at the Hungarian law, for example, a lot of that seems to make sense at face value. But really, the people that are responsible for administering it are the prosecutors. So the NGOs fall under the gaze of an enforcement mechanism that normally you would really want to stay away from. And this ends up being kind of a, a very risky thing because what the public debate is about is often not really what the enforcement mechanisms are about. Now just to show that this uh, kind of lines up these kind of three things that I illustrated here, foreign self-appointed data privilege, we did a mini-survey and we asked people across a good number of countries, how do people characterize your CSO when they attack them? What are the words that are being used? And those will be presumably fairly familiar. Yeah? Answers from the mini-survey, foreign agents, threats to national security, pro-Western mercenaries, and anti-patriotic. So this was one thing that people used to very quickly, these responses are very clearly uh, easy to categorize anti-people, incompetent, against development, anti-nation. And then the usual one in terms of the privilege, the rent seekers, rent eaters, rent the parasites, and corrupt. Now, the regulatory debates that are being put forward arguably are really about the politics of spectacle. They're about, they're drawn out. One of the things that's interesting when you look at these debates, often the regulation isn't being drawn in overnight and it's just there. No, you actually see that it's, they often draw out and out and out and out, in part because it seems to be of interest for the political elite that does this to maintain that level of debate. Why? Because it does these three Ds. It distracts away from the issues, away from the questions of government accountability, onto questions about the CSOs being on the defensive. And who are those CSOs then? It divides the CSOs against each other. And when you look at the legislation, often what gets done is it slices. So in Hungary, a particular source of foreign funding uh, you, you is, is, is the one that you need to declare. In other countries, it's another kind of foreign funding. In Israel, it's by state governments. So that way, some NGOs, some CSOs feel this is not for us, it's not a problem for us. In other contexts, it becomes, uh, and, and our necessities kind of don't necessarily have solidarity. And then it detaches, it disconnects these CSOs from their supporters because they're represented as being elite and not really related to the grassroots. And actually, if you want to look at a great case of that, a case study of that is also the case of the Central European University in Hungary, where exactly the same tactics were at play. Part of that is generating apathy. The underlying message is it's not just about an attack on the CSOs, it's about invalidating the whole. It's about communicating to citizens, whatever you do doesn't really make a difference, you can't really do anything, and ultimately, politics as a dirty spectacle is part of the message that people see to came with. And so, in that way, when you look at it this way, and telling blatant lies, and being caught out in these lies, as some of those people do, is actually part of a sensible messaging strategy because then accusations of these are just lies fly back and forth, and ultimately it's about, well, politics is terrible. Anyway, uh, I don't want to but pox on all of them, all of their houses, I don't want anything to do with that. 
This is really tricky to rank for CSOs. I'll just highlight one thing out of this. I mean, uh, nobody of this mini survey thought that they were well prepared. A study that a former colleague of ours, Jennifer Paturi, did in, in Armenia asked CSOs, how trusted do you think you are, CSO leaders? And 48%, they thought 48% of the population trusted. The real number was 18 so the mismatch between how much people believe they're trusted and how much they're actually trusted is important. And international solidarity is double-edged because they can potentially play exactly into the theme they're actually foreigners uh, and you know, foreign agents. And again, CU is an example of that. Our experience from Transparify, where we advocate for more transparency in policy research, illustrated that at the same time, the gap is real. When we first looked at this, out of one, more than 150 institutions that we looked at, about how transparent they were, where their own funding came from, this was think tanks, only 12, less than 10% were fully transparent about the funding. This is improving, but the point about this is, yes, there are underlying challenges, and it makes sense also to think about this, because as Georgia illustrated with Transparency International and EPRC and several other organizations, when challenges came because they were declaring they can actually highlight to when they were being attacked politically, they said, we have nothing to hide. The funding is all on our website, this is the video. So there's really an opportunity and there are easy gains uh, that you can go for. And I think Georgia has some positive examples in that regard. 18 recommendations that I want to end on. I'm going to run through them very quickly. The report is, um, is, is available if you want to get into more details. And they're for donors. Uh, and for CSOs, and I think maybe more broadly, it could be of interest. Immediately, I do think you have to prepare, and CSOs need to prepare, that they're not going to operate in a space where their own work is guaranteed. Right now, in some contexts, that's the case, and that's good. But I think it's important to be ready for a potential rollback. And why this, that's one of the reasons why discussion like this is very important. Reducing vulnerabilities, that's one of the things that I mentioned. Uh, already that I think is important, and that's easy to do when you take an outside view. Uh, I'll have a little kind of slot, kind of jab here at the Open Society Foundation, when I recently looked, big organization, when I recently looked at their own accountability, their own Ombuds person, I discovered that the Ombuds person was, at this point, had just celebrated their 90th birthday, and the last time the page was updated was 2012. So taking an outside view of your own organization is really a good idea because you might discover things that, that you don't know. And I was re referring to big OSI. There are a couple of other things in here. Uh, training for debates um, and the, the things you can do. Let me just maybe highlight one thing that I think is absolutely relevant and then I'll skip over the others. The training for debates. How do you best respond to being attacked in public? That's a hard, that's a hard thing to do. And I think even if one has looked at a lot of focus groups, as I have thanks to Andy Eisberg and to Mary, uh, Mary Higgins, who will speak later, it's still often what works for people and how what they respond to, but what they don't respond to is hard to predict. And this is, I think, why all these misinformation and on this kind of on this attack on the organizations. There's a central role for local research, for quality research that's both uh, does qualitative research and focus groups to see what are people, how are certain things framed in people's minds, and then for quantitative research that looks at that in a larger way to help understand how to do that. And one of the best things that CSOs can do is to really understand how populism in their own context is structured to decide how they get into debates, how they frame debates in ways that are going to appeal to a broader audience that's out there, and not necessarily in the way that they frame those ideas with regards to the donors. Because some of the donors may insist on ideas of universal rights, etc., that aren't necessarily fully understood in rural contexts, in marginalized contexts, in contexts where people haven't had uh, many positive advantages from the organization. And so in that context, local research remains absolutely central um, so that ultimately people can connect to the grassroots because the public legitimacy really matters 
in these debates, and I think there, there are opportunities for looking back. Thank you very much.